Okay. Um, well, thanks for coming in. Um, and thanks for that last session. That was really, really interesting, actually. Um, some of what you'll see in this session, if you hang around, I don't know if you're going somewhere else, would have been really good to have paragraphs when we did this project. Um, and you might see why. <laughs> so what, uh, what this session is about uh, is a, a launch of a very large e-commerce site. Now, whenever I've presented this before, this brand has been very well known, but I don't think it's in Slovakia at all. Am I right? No. So this is, there'll be a little bit more intro, I guess, um, ab about this particular brand. So uh, what I've actually got a little bit of a, an intro video, but I don't think I actually have audio. So um, I'm going to play a bit of it, and we'll just see how it goes. Um, it's a couple of minutes long, and it just gives you an intro. So basically what it is is that Lush, Lush is a handmade cosmetics firm. Uh, based out of the UK, but they actually have a worldwide presence. Um, so I'm just going to quickly show you this. If it doesn't work, then I'll stop it and we'll move on. But So I appreciate that's a bit of a long one. Um, so that's a little bit of an introduction to that company. Now, what I want this session to be about is that you see these great case studies about Drupal, and that's all you really see. You don't actually see much behind the scenes of how this thing was put together, and I think that's the interesting part, certainly for me. Um, so 
what I'm going to do here is just uh, break down some of the ways that we approach this site. Now, this, this site was built, and it's exclusively Drupal. Uh, there's no demandware at the back or none of that. It's, it's Drupal, Drupal Commerce uh, through and through. So uh, as I say, Lush is a handmade cosmetics company in the UK. They've got 910 stores, so all over the world, and a pretty large annual turnover. Um, what they were trying to do when they came to us was build what they've called, well, what a lot of people now call content-driven commerce. Um, and that is the idea that instead of just a, a list of products uh, where you're clicking them and putting them in the shopping basket, the idea here is that every product has a story behind it. Now, in this case, we've got a company that um, they care very much about the ethics and the sourcing of their ingredients and that sort of thing. So what it was about here is that every product is made of ingredients, and every one of those ingredients comes from somewhere. It has a story behind it. And what they were trying to do here was to tell the story of these products through the website. Um, and that's one of the main reasons they went to Drupal, because this wasn't just a pure e-commerce idea. This was something that you wanted to merge content and commerce together. And that is something that at Drupal is very, very strong. Uh, so this, this is a job that we, uh, ICOS, we worked together with Commerce Guys. Um, we worked throughout the, the project working together. And there was another company uh, providing the design, a company called Method in London. And we also worked with the Lush digital team because they have an internal dev team. And so it was a, a complete mix of people working together for the first time. So what I want to do is take you through, I can't show you everything, it's going to take too long, but uh, in the time we've got, just to show you some of the techniques that we used on this site that you might find interesting or useful for projects of your own. Um, so the things I want to talk about today are uh, the, the use of a pattern guide or a style guide, which you may have come across before. It's something that we're seeing more and more often now in, in large projects, so we'll talk about that a little bit. There's a piece on complex page layouts, and that's where the paragraph stuff comes in, um, because paragraphs wasn't wasn't an option for us when we started this project. It was you know, a good few years ago now. Um, and I'll talk about how we approached uh, those layouts. How we've used Solar. Um, we use Apache Solar for search, but we also took it a little bit further on this particular project and use Solar in ways that some people are not, not expecting. Um, so that, that's quite an interesting one. And then we're going to look at very quickly at where we've integrated with other systems because what we found is it's not always about Drupal. There are some times where um, there are some other systems that just work better for a particular use case, so it's how we can connect to those. And then finally, performance, because with a, a high-end e-commerce site, and e-commerce in general, it's really, really important to have a fast performing site. Um, otherwise, you lose customers and you lose sales. So the pattern guide approach, um, is, is an interesting one because what we had um, with the brief for this project, it, was, it wasn't just a three breakpoint site, you know, phone, tablet, desktop. It, it was a little bit more uh, adventurous than that. And they went for six breakpoints. And what they wanted to do was break the design at the point of whether it felt that the design was right to change, not necessarily based on the device that was looking at it. And so there was quite a lot of front-end requirements here. Um, and we were working on an agile process, and we had a very tight timeline to get to. And what we ended up doing was build, building what we now recognize as a pattern guide. And what it means is you build the front end of the site outside Drupal in plain HTML. And then you, you, that allows you to test uh, the site, test the responsive nature, and do some rudimentary user testing before you go anywhere near Drupal. So what I'm able to show you, we were able to test out the things like the interactions, the animations, and those sorts of things, and how they were going to work. And it meant that we had two parallel teams running, one team doing the front end, and one team doing the actual e-commerce build on the back. And the other thing with this is once you've done this approach, you've got this permanent reference guide that sits there forever, um, and hopefully would be updated as the, as the needs of the business change. So when, for example, one of the things in that video was we introduced this handwritten font, we're able to test that concept in our style guide. So what I want to do is very quickly show you some of it uh, on an offline version. Here we go. Hope it's clear. 
here. So this is the star guide that was used for, for this particular project. So star guides, or as I say, pattern guides, they're sometimes referred to now. Um, you start off with very, very simple stuff. Like you say, right, what? <laughs> Let's hope this works locally. It's not looking good, is it? Yes, it is. OK. So you start off at the rudimentary, very, very small elements. So what does a form element look like? What does an error message look like? And you work on it, not in the context of a whole page, but as an individual component. Um, and what you do is you then build those pieces up. Uh, and then things that you would expect to be obvious, what are the colors we use? What are the codes for those colors? So there's no question about, am I using the right shade of red, gray, whatever color it might be? And so we, we went through all of these elements. Um, so we know what a form looks like. We know what the validation on a form looks like, all completely independently of Drupal. Um, and that meant that by the time it came to building the site, we had everything we wanted uh, directly there so that we could compare. So, uh, and the approach that we used was throughout here. So if we take an example of this one here, even a simple thing like a product can actually appear in loads of different ways. So what we've got here is you take your smallest piece of content, which is in this case a product, and you say, right, how can this appear on the website? So it could appear in a list, which is this one. It could appear as a promoted item, which is this one here. It could also appear there, but no one's reviewed the product yet, so it looks slightly different. Uh, it could be a related product or it could be on someone's wish list, or um, it could be attached to an article. So when you think it through, even a small component of content can appear in loads of different ways on the site. And what we did was we used the Drupal concept of view modes. You'll have seen this because when you start off in Drupal, you've got a teaser and a full content. That's what you get as your view modes. But what you're able to do is you're able to extend those view modes and then come up with as many as you want. So in this case, what we did was to say, OK, this is uh, a product teaser, the standard one. But this one's called a product featured. And this one's a you know, product, product featured, no review. So we were able to expand out all of those things. And what that allowed us to do is take in this concept of view modes is when you're making, say, a view, as in a Drupal view, Instead of doing fields, what you can say is, right, show me all the products displayed in this particular view mode. And by doing that, it means that you're in control of the markup, and you can copy the markup directly from your pattern guide. So that's the approach we took. And we've, we've been working on this now uh, further for uh, other projects after this. And uh, so hopefully, we'll have some more interesting stuff to share on that in the, in the near future. Completely wrong presentation. Right, there we go. So the next thing is we have these rather complex page layouts. Um, we used Omega 4 as our base theme. Um, and we used layout selection using context. Um, and as I was mentioned earlier, view modes we used. So you can show the same content in different layouts by using different view modes. Um, and then what we were able to do is to from using theme suggestions in Drupal, theme hook suggestions in Drupal to figure out which bit of the style guide to use. And that's when you end up with this. So a product page on this particular site looks like this. So it, you've got the product at the top, what the, the bit you would expect, the add to basket. But as you go on, what we're trying to do again is tell the whole story of the product. So as the page goes down, you'll see some highlighted reviews of that product. Then you'll see all the ingredients that are within it. Then you might see a story about where those ingredients came from. And then as you keep going, you've got more reviews. Then you've got related products. So it's all these things stacking on top of each other. And so the approach that we used here was to use these view modes to say, OK, what a page really is is all these things. When you look at it, they're all slices, and they all join on top of each other. So that's the approach we used here. Now, I think with paragraphs now in existence, there's an interesting uh, uh, sort of parallel between, uh, between that module and what we've done here. So it would be very interesting to, 
you know, go back in time and do it again with, with that knowledge. And that's always the case with Drupal. There's always new stuff that comes out of projects like this. And so this is another example. So we're able to show, uh, again, the products, what they would appear on my wish list if I had one. Um, and, and again, just using the same content in a slightly different context. And the same here with, a, with an ingredient being shown. Okay, and this one is just another example showing how all of those things stick together. So it's always in vertical slices as we go down the page. And they can go on and on and on. So these are very, very heavy uh, pages. This, one, this particular one is the, is the dashboard when you're logged in as a user and you want to go into the see your account. So all of these different components represent, you know, this is a product again, but this is a product that I happen to have on my wish list. So a lot of what we did um, within the site was we used Solar, so Apache Solar. Um, you, you can't really do, yeah, you can do stuff with Drupal core search, but it's really not that powerful. It's also quite slow. Uh, so you, you can't get very good uh, results for if you make a spelling mistake or something like that. And with the sort of stuff that we were doing here, the search is that we were doing were quite complicated. So what we're able to do with, with by having Solar as our search engine, we're able to make sure that the actual the hard work of doing the search was handed over somewhere else. Um, it was much more powerful and more accurate as a result. And it allowed us to do uh, fasted search filtering, which you can't do in the core Drupal search. The other thing it allowed us to do was geospatial search. So. If you're doing a store locator or something like that, um, one way to do it, well, there's actually quite a few ways to do it in Drupal. You can use uh, geo fields and, and so on. And we actually managed to use solar for this as well. So by sending uh, the coordinates to the solar search engine, we got back the clearest, uh, the nearest shops, for example. So in this case, actually, it was hosted with Acquia. So we had Acquia search, which is just solar. Um, but the one of the interesting things was that we decided, as well as search, to think about the category pages as search results pages. Um, everything we were doing with this project was about trying to keep the performance as high as we could. Um, so normally, if you think about, okay, I've make, I'm making a shop, I want to have a, this is my bath category, I want to have all the products here. Uh, normally, you might just think, okay, I'll do a view or something like that. And in this case, what we decided to do was um, was build these category pages as search results pre-rendered. So what we do is we say, this is what a product looks like in a search result, and we send the HTML for that into Solar so that when we render the results, there's no additional work for Drupal to do. Because what you'll find is a lot of the time, you'll get the resu results back, and then you'll get Drupal to do loads of changes to the markup and that just you know, negates the, the benefits of the speed. So this is an example of a product list page, which is uh, at the top, it's just showing the, uh, the parallaxed um, category, which would have been good in paragraphs, apparently. Um, and as we go down, everything else below here is coming directly out of Solar. So we can generate that page, which is obviously quite complex layout in you know, milliseconds rather than you know, a couple of seconds that Drupal would take to build that. And then we also have the ability to add these facets at the top because of using Solar. So we can, um, we've got 213 results there and we can narrow it down by, by the different types. And again, all of that's provided by Solar, so it keeps as much of the load off of Drupal as we possibly can. One of the interesting things for, about this was there is so much you can do in Drupal but sometimes you've got to look at it and say, is it the best use of my time or the client's budget to build this thing from scratch just because I can, or should I be looking at a third-party system? Um, in this case, we used various systems. Um, I won't uh, really go through them in detail, but um, we used off-site video encoding, um, Metapack for calculating shipping options in Drupal Commerce, where you could, of course, create all the rules in Drupal Commerce yourself, but it just sometimes it's just not worth that effort. So yeah, there was a lot of options uh, to, to hook in the external services. And then the final piece of this 
of this puzzle was really about performance. You see how big those pages were, how far they go, and how complex they are. Um, we needed to be able to do that because we couldn't compromise on the design, but we needed to be able to do it quickly. So there's a lot of caching going on. Um, what we're actually using solar for, as I just described, is almost like a cache layer. Um, we need to have that fast delivery, and we need to keep an eye on it. So we were using uh, third-party systems uh, to, to, uh, to improve that. So actually, Milan uh, is going to be doing a session after this one, next door, because um, Milan worked on this project. Um, and he's going to, I think he's doing it in Slovak as well. Um, so it will be about these types of techniques that are used in, in performance, so various caching techniques that we have. Uh, and so I won't go into that too much, but if you're interested in that particular topic, I'd pop over to the other room after this. Um, and one of the really important things we had to do was, was keep an eye on this. So we used a service called New Relic. Uh, I don't know if uh, anyone's used it before, but it's, it's one of those things, once you've started to use it, it's really, <coughs> it's really a really sort of invaluable tool. What it does, it sits on your server and it measures everything that's going on. So this particular graph is showing us the, how quickly you can build a page. So the blue at the bottom is how much time is spent in PHP. The orange is how much time is spent in a database. Uh, blue is memcache, and the green is when it's gone to some other service outside of Drupal, like Google Analytics or something similar. So with that, what we can do is we can keep an eye on how quickly the site is being, uh, is being delivered and look for bottlenecks. This particular tool allows you to drill right into the web transactions, right down to the very module and method and you can figure out exactly where the pain point is coming from um, if you've got enough time to dig around in that data. So that was absolutely brilliant. But the important thing with caching is uh, you have to have the ability to purge those caches, so to clear those caches out, um, because the, especially with something like an e-commerce site, if a product goes out of stock and you're really aggressively caching the pages for speed, you're suddenly showing someone a product that they can't buy anymore and they don't realize it. So we had to look at different techniques and we used um, the purging and ac expire and acquire purge modules to do that. So to sum up in just a couple of minutes I've got, um, what, what did we learn through this? So number one for me, New Relic. If you're not using it and you have the opportunity to, I would definitely have a look. New Relic will save your life. Um, when you've got a performance issue, it, it, it's really hard to figure out where to look first. Um, New Relic tells you exactly where to look first and what you need to do to fix it, whether it be a bad database query or some you know, badly written code or whatever. The other thing I think we, we took from this project was the complexity of migration of data and how hard that really is, and we maybe underestimated that. Um, in this case, we had to migrate seven years' worth of orders and customers and everything else, uh, and it's a lot of data. And I think the worst thing about that is not so much the complexity of doing it, but how long it takes, literally days, to run these migrations. So you have to be, when you're doing iterations, it's quite slow. Um, look at build versus buy, because although, as I said earlier, you can build pretty much everything you want in Drupal given time, um, sometimes it's the most efficient thing to do is pick a third-party service that is really good. We used, for example, Nosto uh, for doing product recommendations, so people who bought this would also like this kind of stuff. Um, whilst we could have done that in Drupal, we knew that it really wasn't sensible to spend loads of time on that particular thing. Um, keep your partners close, working with a team from lots of different companies, some from, people from Commerce Guys, some from Method, some from Lush. Uh, really important to work closely together um, if with a new team, that was important. And yeah, don't forget caching, because it is hard, and it does take loads of time out of the project, so always allow for that. Um, the other thing was about custom versus contrib, and there's a big argument here about using, if you do custom modules, then you're creating technical debt for yourself and the project. But sometimes there's a contrib module that appears to be the right one for the thing you're trying to do, but it's not quite right. And it's really important to look at that objectively and say, 
how much work am I going to have to do to that contrib to get it to do what I want, as opposed to completely doing it from scratch? It's a tough one. There's no right or wrong answer there, but it's definitely worth thinking about, rather than just assuming every time there's a Drupal module, I have to use it. And then following from that, really, is remembering the legacy. Who, who's taking this site on in the long term? We've completed uh, our tour of duty now on this particular project, and the internal team have taken it on for the long term. So we had to train them. Um, they didn't have Drupal developers at first, so we've now trained their developers. Um, but it's really important to remember who's going to be lead, who's going to be looking after this in the long term. And in a similar way, try to plan for tomorrow. This was an MVP, a uh, minimum viable product launch. Um, they had loads of loads of other ideas, but the trouble is, if you try and build support for every random idea that they had, you'd never have got the project done. So it's a very close balance between planning for tomorrow without spending too much time today. And that is me. So um, yeah, I don't like that slide at all. <laughs> so we'll come back. Um, I know, as I say, we started a little bit late, but um, has anyone got any questions? Probably. So did you co also consider auth cache while caching the page? Yeah, um, in the original launch, we didn't have auth cache. Um, so yeah, absolutely, because of with e-commerce, the moment that someone has put something in their basket, all your caching is gone. So yeah, yeah it's not just about, uh, you have to consider when people are logged in, because um, obviously you can't cache as well then. And that's why we had several other caching strategies. We were looking at, okay, when you look at this whole page, what's the, what's the difference between not being logged in and when you are? And it's actually not much. It's like a little picture of yourself in the corner. So auth cache can be used for that in that it can um, cache all of the page but leave a little gap where that piece of content is going to go. So yeah, auth cache is a, is a real lifesaver here. Have you used any uh, cache warmer or something like that? Uh, um, we don't actually use a cache warmer here. Um, the public is the cache warmer because this site, um, this site is very, very busy and uh, it, it really, yeah, the, the the first couple of seconds, the cache is pretty much warmed back up again. I do understand, but uh, I'm thinking quite often, what about the users who are the first, who are looking at it? Mm -hmm. uh, what about the experience? And if it, there is a possibility, you know you need to change the data to sue them from the cache, but you can spare them there for one minute more or something like that, yep. to use some warm cacher which would do the work in the background and switch, uh, switch the new one. Well, j just the idea, if it's not necessary, and usually even on such, uh, but, made, but I can say not uh, on this such uh, big page, uh, big uh, website, um, but sorry, I uh, okay. over. Um, yeah, the, a cache warmer is definitely useful. Um, in this case, because quite a lot of the traffic was non-cached because of the it being e-commerce, we had to make sure that the site could still run. Um, what we obviously what we want is as much traffic as possible to go through cash, but we knew that it couldn't all go through. So cash volume wasn't as important because because of the fact that we needed to work on the performance without caching anyway. Um, so yeah, there is an argument for putting it in, that's for sure. But we didn't have it on this particular launch. Okay, so just another one question. Uh, so. When you were thinking about the caching, you were thinking about the uh, performance, or the workload which goes to the servers and so on, or you were thinking uh, in the term of the experience of the user. What's the most uh, um, valued? In the e-commerce, it's going to be about the experience of the user. Um, we, you know, there are various stats that I don't have here that say you know if you if your page load time is below three seconds or whatever, then people just don't complete the sale. This company are quite lucky in that their products are exclusive to them. So it's not like someone can go somewhere else. So they have that advantage. But if that's not the case, then you really have to consider your, um, your front end user experience and how quickly, even if the whole page hasn't come in, how quickly you get, the, you get a page that's usable in front of the customer. Yeah. OK, thanks for the answers. Okay.
Okay, I think that's it then. Well, thank you very much for bearing with me. I um, hope I didn't speak too fast. I'm not used to non-English non <laughs> sessions. So thanks for coming, everyone. <laughs>